Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Dennis Walcott, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York Urban League. Now, Mr. Walcott uh, is from Queens, where he grew up and attended the New York City Public Schools. He has uh, received a master's degree in social work from Fordham University and a master's degree in education from the University of Bridgeport. He has been a member of the Board of Education in the last uh, period for uh, Chancellor uh, Fernandez and then uh, at the beginning of Chancellor Cortinas, so he certainly is familiar with the problems of the Board of Education, and he has been appointed uh, by Chancellor Crewe to be president of uh, uh, trustees for a Community School District 5. Uh, therefore, uh, I welcome you because Thank you. Uh, today, as usual, education is a, it's in a state of crisis in New York City. Well, one of the things I don't have on my bio that I should also mention, I'm a certified teacher as well. Oh, so when the system is looking for certified teachers, I may resign from the league and go back. I taught kindergarten for around two and a half years as well. So uh, I'll tell Randy Weingarten. Yeah, tell Randy because yeah. Randy's looking for a whole yeah, lot of new yeah. teachers. But uh, obviously it's in the news today when we talk about the issue of principals and principal accountability and the issue of tenure. So uh, we're talking about accountability up and down the system. Well, tell us about the story that appeared in the New York Times which uh, yesterday which indicated that uh, there's really uh, no change uh, in the so-called elimination of principal's tenure because uh, uh, last year when a, a school superintendent in, uh, in Brooklyn District tried, 19, District 19 mm -hmm. uh, tried to get rid of uh, 10 principals, it ended up that he was fired mm -hmm. uh, and six of the principals are back there again. Uh, and because the bureaucracy is so rigid that it's hard to uh, really take effective action against uh, even admittedly bad principles. Yeah, it's really a difficult situation because when you look about accountability and removing people who perform poorly, uh, it goes to the heart of what the battle has been around tenure and trying to remove principals as well as teachers who are not really serving our children properly. And what the article in the New York Times pointed out is that a number of the principals who were dismissed or transferred or moved down to assistant principal lines are now back after the superintendent was fired. And I think part of the challenge is how you remove bad principals, how you make sure there's a top-down level of accountability in dealing with performance of schools. And this article pointed out, I think, the transition of from one superintendent to another and the difficulty of any district of holding their principals and then for teachers accountable for the performance of students. Well, you served as a member of the Board of Education, and, and you know Chancellor Harold Levy, right? Mm -hmm. I well, know Chancellor Levy more from our corporate dealings with Citigroup, but also now directly through him being the uh, interim acting chancellor. So well. what advice would you give him as the interim chancellor now? Well, I think one of the things, obviously, he's there for a six-month period of time. He has to have very concrete plans of what he needs to accomplish. Obviously, he's talked about the issue of summer school and ramping up the system for hopefully uh, the students who will be going through summer school and passing in summer school, so keeping focused on that. I think, again, also he has to deal with the issue of management accountability because you have a number of superintendents who are not permanent superintendents in place. So you have a number of districts that are drifting right now, and he needs to meet with the superintendents and hold them accountable as far as the performance of their districts, really doing a report card on them, and where possible working with the local school boards to make sure that new districts uh, superintendents are appointed as quickly as possible, therefore impacting the principals in those districts as well. So management accountability within the 32 districts as well as the supervision of the high school, because as you very well know, uh, the new region standards are even ramping up to a new level uh, this coming June. So the high schools have to be really in line with those new standards mean and making sure that the high schools are performing at maximum level so students can pass their regions. And so he has to be, I think, very clear as far as the issues of accountability and as much as possible, and again, you know this way better than I do, stay out of the political fights uh, if that's possible. Well, he faces uh, an immediate, uh, very difficult problem because, as you know, I was one of those who pushed Chancellor Crewe to eliminate social promotion, mm -hmm. and it took about four years to get him to agree to do so. But uh, the elimination of social promotion doesn't really take effect until next June, June. 
when about 360,000 students uh, will be left behind. This and coming that, June, that you mean? This June, coming June, this June of this June. year. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is, there isn't much time to plan for right. it. And that is probably the most massive upheaval that the New York City Board of Education has ever had, to provide for summer school for 360,000 children, especially when the teachers are not necessarily available. There is no air conditioning. And uh, I don't think most of the parents know what's happening. Well, there are two issues. I mean, one is the instructional part of the discussion around the elimination of social promotion. And then on the other side, you have the capital issue, the infrastructure issue that you're talking about, the air conditioning, the buildings being in place, and then having the teachers in place to make sure that the schools are staffed properly. And so you don't have large classes, but you have as small a class as possible, so that way the students get maximum learning at the local school level. So Chancellor Levy has a major job. He still has, though, the two deputy chancellors in place, Judith Rizzo, as well as Harry Spence, at least for now, who hopefully have been doing a lot of work in preparing for the potential 300,000 students that you're talking about. And then the other piece that I think is extremely important is the role of parents in this process. Well, and tell us then that. about uh, the New York Urban League. What is the New York Urban League and, and uh, who do you represent and how do you uh, uh, distribute your efforts throughout the uh, New York City of New York? Well, the New York Urban League is now an 80-year-old organization that is a citywide organization with offices and programs in the five boroughs of the city. Uh, programs range from employment and training programs to health services to social services uh, to educational services. We have in-school-based programs as well as scholarship programs. And as you may well know, we were recently awarded by the Board of Ed a contract to deal with the implementation of the school leadership teams as well. Uh, this coming Thursday, uh, we will be having a school leadership meeting at the Board of Ed. We're inviting parents, administrators, and teachers to talk about the process uh, that will be unfolding to make sure that all schools have school leadership teams in place. So we have both direct service programs as well as we get involved in advocacy and public policy as uh, we've been involved in a number of discussion around a variety of issues impacting the education of our children. Do you support the elimination of social promotion? Oh, without question. I think what has happened, though, uh, it's become politicized and people don't understand what it means to eliminate social promotion and then also it's not just as you've been ta are talking about over the years not just a word of eliminating social promotion but what supports need to be in place to make sure you have the supportive services so it can be done in a very planned manner uh, the type of remediation the type of education the instructional supports that'll be in place so you don't have students just repeating in summer school and still failing in summer school as well so well it's unlikely if you have 360,000 students who will be going to summer school, uh, it is unlikely that all of them will be able to pass. I mean, you mm -hmm. have to assume, uh, and I know this from uh, my wife, who's a seventh, seventh grade, grade teacher, teacher. Sure. that a lot of them are, are quite behind, and, and if they're a year or two behind, it'll take more than six or eight weeks of summer school to make it up, so that they'll have to be uh, remedial programs for a huge number of students. Without question, again, that's where parents play a key role in this as well because I think a lot of misinformation has gone out both around what it means to eliminate social promotion, the supports that will be there, and the role of the parents in working with teachers and administrators to support the students so that way they can get to grade level. And I think this is a collective effort on how we address the issue of eliminating social promotion. And then at the same time, as you remember from last year, there was a lot of confusion on who actually qualified uh, for summer school. And so we have to be very clear as far as the test scores and the methods of evaluation of who actually will be the students who will participate in the summer school program as well. And then timely information getting out to the parents so then the children don't go off to camp, don't go away, and they know exactly how they'll have to respond in preparation for summer school. Well, it's already uh, the end of January, practically, and I know in the Hispanic community, most of the parents don't even know what social promotion is because uh, if they come from uh, where I come from, Puerto Rico mm -hmm. or other Latin American countries, and you get a report card that says the child passed, they assume that uh, the student has been learning. They don't understand that social promotion has meant that the children are automatically promoted. Well, I think part of the role of the League and other organizations in the community is to disseminate information on exactly what we're talking about so parents are informed consumers and know exactly what's happening in their child's life. Uh, the Board of Ed can be very daunting even to the most mm -hmm. uh, involved person in the community, much less people for whatever reason may not be as actively involved. 
Uh, this past Saturday, I was out at a district talking to parents. This coming Thursday, we're having a meeting with parents. And what we've been trying to do at the New York Urban League is make sure we disseminate as much information as possible through either me or my staff getting out to the local communities and spreading the word. And I think using as many vehicles, whether it's local indigenous-based radio stations, television stations, or newspapers, to get the information out on exactly a step-by-step -step process of what will be happening in their child's education over the next five to six months. Yeah, because it seems to me that unless the community groups like you get involved, parents won't know. I know that uh, I don't read very much about this in the Spanish papers, mm -hmm. which I get every day. Right. Um, so parents wouldn't know what's happening. Well, it's going to catch parents. On well, radio or television. Part, part of our challenge in the community, and this includes faith-based organizations as well, is making sure that we stay out of the political fights because so much information can be sucked into political issues versus the educational issues which may have political overtones. And I think our challenge is to get clear, concise messages out to people as far as what will exactly happen, making sure that the chancellor and board members are able to communicate that information. I've been encouraging board members, and when I was a member of the New York City Board of Education, I held local community meetings in the boroughs that I represented. Since I was a citywide representative, I was able to go to all five boroughs and convene meetings in local housing developments as well as block associations. And I think the board members, if they're not doing it, have a responsibility to convene local meetings within their particular borough on a citywide basis to disseminate that information and certainly as well. the local school board should be holding meetings. Oh, without question. I mean, well, the local school boards always have their meetings. I think the challenge is making sure about that this people... Issue. Oh, not just about this issue, but yes, they need to make sure that this issue is included in their meetings on a regular agenda basis so that way people who participate uh, know what's going on. And then the inclusion of faith-based organizations and institutions because, as you know, within our respective communities, people will go to churches, uh, go to mosques, go to synagogues, and that type of information should be disseminated and readily available at those institutions so people know exactly what's happening. Okay. We'll be back after these announcements. You don't have to like me. Or you can. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be my friend. But you might like me if you got to know me. You don't have to be my roommate. I am going to be your neighbor. You don't have to run with me. You really don't have to run away from me. You may not like what I have to say. But hear me. Hear me. Hear me out. And what not all that different? I like good food. Good music. I love my mom. Yeah, I want to fall in love. Madly. <laughs> I want a good job. <laughs> I want my kids to live in a world where they are safe and loved and respected for who they are. You don't have to like me, but if you talk to me. You might. We can end prejudice if we talk to each other. Call. Call. Tell us what you do. Together we can build one America. We're back today with Dennis Walcott, the president and chief executive officer of the New York Urban League. Now, we talked about uh, the elimination of social promotion, but this year, in addition to that, we also have the problem of the regents, regents. examination. Uh -huh. And that is going to affect a very substantial number of uh, young people who may not graduate from high school if they can't pass the regents. Right. Yeah, How do you I, see that problem? Well, I think one of the differences right now is that parents and the high school students are more aware of the new regent standards. So as a result of them being aware, I think a lot of their attention is going towards making sure that they're able to pass. I can deal with my daughter and son who are in high school right now. And they definitely know the new standards and what regions they have to pass at what grade level since my son is in the ninth grade and my daughter is in the tenth grade. And they're very acclimated to that and I think a lot of students are. But I think it also goes to the support systems that need to be in place and making sure those support systems are not solely at the Board of Ed, but that community organizations and other groups that are out there having reinforced programs of teaching and tutoring so that way our students are more prepared to pass the Regents. Now, this is Regents Week, right? This is Regents Week for those students who need to either make up Regents or just may have failed a Regent or for whatever reason of timing are taking Regents, but obviously the majority of the Regents will be taking place in June. And so students really are gearing up for the Regents that will be taking place in June. Now, do you support the uh, Regents, the highest standards in the Regents? Well, yeah, but as you know, New York, I think, is the only state 
that has a system of regents. And as you indicated in the introduction of the show, uh, I'm a New York City public school student myself, a former student myself, and I remember the pressure of taking the regents even back then, and luckily I passed all the regents some okay some yeah. and as a result of that it's an added pressure but I think it goes to the heart of making sure that we have high standards in our system and talk about educational outcomes uh, and not just having students pass from one grade to another so I think there's need to be there needs to be a clear distinction in our discussion as far as region standards what it means for outcome of achievement or high achievement levels and the issue of making sure our students are learning and being taught uh, courses that allow them to be prepared and compete uh, with other students from across the country. No, the thing that bothers me the most is the fact that such a high percentage of students drops out in the 10th grade. Mm -hmm. In other words, we in the Hispanic community we have uh, almost a 50 percent dropout rate and that's to me is the biggest tragedy because if you don't have even a high school diploma Oh, especially Today, in today's society, trouble. forget about it. Yeah, I mean, so, back in my parents' generation, one may be able to survive without a high school diploma because they would get a trade job. Well, like my father, who did not have a high school diploma, uh, found a job, became a very successful man as a result of just having a very ambitious attitude. But today, you really can't do that. It's important for us. Where we lose students, Herman, is not necessarily at 10th grade, even though you have a high dropout level. That's what happens, but it starts early. Oh, it starts early, and then yeah. the middle school years are really very difficult years, as your wife, who teaches 7th grade, probably experiences with a number of students. And setting the pan, uh, foundation for learning, making sure that in the community we're talking about high academic achievement, and not allowing to become politicized where people hear about uh, higher standards and not understand what higher standards actually means, because I think all communities want their students performing at optimal level. I think the question is how do we put the supports in place both at a school base level as well as community level to make sure those students are able to achieve at a high level. Well of course as, as chairman of the board of the city university uh -huh. I start out at the college level so then uh, people say well the idea of having high standards at college is fine but you really should go back to the high schools. So then we set up this program of college now yeah, where we I'm intend to begin working with the young people in the ninth grade to make sure, sure they don't drop out. So then they say, well, you really should go back to the junior high schools. So then we have, we're beginning to adopt charter schools right. where we have tied into the colleges junior high schools as well as high school. Then they say, but really the problem is in the elementary schools and the problem really is and begins when the kids come into kindergarten or the first grade because they already are way behind because in a middle class community uh, in uh, Connecticut for example uh, you when the children come in they already can operate computers and they can uh, uh, they can uh, read uh, 25 books a week so um, what could be done to really evaluate the students in the first grade to really try to cope with the problem at the earliest possible opportunity? Well, I think it's not an easy issue. And it's obviously not an easy issue because you can look at every grade level and find problems associated with every grade level. I think obviously part of the battle, the battle is making sure there are lower class sizes so that way you have maximum learning. Uh, making sure that a school's equipped. In, in the earlier grades? Oh, I'm talking about the early grade with a computer in every classroom and computers in every school so that way students have the opportunity to have reinforced learning through computers as well. Making sure that you have certified teachers both in the early grades, middle grades, and definitely in high school as well so teachers are not teaching out of their course area. Making sure you have principals in place who are being held accountable for the performance of the school and the teachers in that particular school. And I think one of the challenges, and that's where the league and other organizations play a role, making sure that the community is involved in this whole process as well. Putting the challenge to the community as far as high academic standards are concerned and parent engagement in the process so parents are full participants in this overall process as well. And I think within the first grade, obviously, reading and certain basic tenets of learning have to take place. But I think full participation of parents as far as setting the standards and reinforcing the role of teachers in those schools. And then the reinforcement of books, uh, having community leaders, and I put it in quote, talking about turning off the television, making sure reinforced reading takes place. Uh, at this parent forum that I did this past Saturday, I talked about 
uh, children who may not like to read, but have you as a parent tapping into your child's area of interest, uh, whether it's wrestling and wrestling magazines or other area of interest, and how you really become a teacher at home, reinforcing the teaching that takes place in school. And I think those type of systems have to be put in place at every grade level and with monitoring by the parents and the community as far as full participation. Well, I, I find, uh, and I found when I was uh, congressman and president of the Bronx, that the problem is that we rely upon the Board of Education to reach out to the parents. And I don't think the Board of Education really has the resources to do that. No, we rely on the Board of Ed not just to do that. We yeah. rely on teachers and the board to be social workers, yeah, health care providers, it. and everything else. And they're there to teach and educate our children. And it's the role of the community to make sure if parents aren't involved. Uh, that we put systems in place to engage parents into the educational system itself, uh, making sure that information is disseminated to them on a regular basis, making sure, as we talked about earlier, school leadership teams are in place so people know the law and are fully participant in what the law is about. I don't think the Board of Education can do all of that. I think the Board of Education is a big enough problem just making sure they have the teachers in the classroom and they provide the teaching. I think that we need a separate organization to reach out to the parents. Uh, when you say a separate organization, oh, you mean like Urban League? Well, I think so. the board has started to see that wisdom. I mean, with more of their services being contracted out to CBOs, community-based organizations, and other types of organizations, so it's not on their shoulders and then mm -hmm. monitoring that, whether it's the New York Urban League, whether it's a SPIRA, whether it's other groups and communities, faith-based institutions throughout the city, so that way there's a partnership. Let's look at a district that's always been a high performing district, District 26. And what you'll see probably with a District 26 is a full community, including parents, local businesses, corporations, politicians, all involved in working with the district to make sure students are learning at a very high level. And I think we need, need to model that throughout all the local districts, and much less talking about the new governance laws, what, which deals with accountability. Let's look at the district where you were uh, a trustee. District where 5, where what, I was. What happened there? Well, District 5 is an interesting case study. Tell us because where it is, first District of all. 5 is in Central Harlem, and Chancellor Crew has suspended the district uh, board members for a variety of reasons, and then appointed three people as trustees uh, to take over the district on a temporary basis, and then I became the president of the three trustees. And we put some systems in place. We brought in an outside administrator to take over the district. And similar to what was in the New York Times article, I had to double check which district they were talking about. Uh, he removed some principals, demoted some principals, and reassigned principals to deal with some issues. And then he was also, after we, the trustees, left and the new board came back in, uh, he was then removed and a new uh, superintendents in place. Uh, but it's a district that's a very low performing district, but I think it's a district with students who can achieve at a very high level. And our challenge is to make sure that we cut through the politics and the nonsense of district warfare that takes place and keep education as a focal, focal point uh, for the parents and the students. So I think that's the challenge that the district, but the other key piece, and I must say this, it comes with continuity as well. You can't have churning superintendents time after time in districts or churning chancellors time after time without accountability being put in there as far as the supervision of those individuals. Does it make sense to have those district superintendents? How would you change the structure of the Board of Education? Well, I think the 1996 governance law went a good way of changing accountability. I believe in top-down accountability. I mean, you need to have accountability as far as the chancellor, the superintendent, the principal, and the teachers. I think the principals still have to have more accountability over teachers. And I think Randy, who is a good friend uh, and part of the union negotiations, that has to be part of the discussion between the Board of Ed and the UFT as far as accountability of teachers and the issue of tenure as well and what it means. Uh, so those teachers who are not performing properly are removed. Uh, it deals with the accountability. And what would you do with them once they're removed? Just to be out of the system? Bye. Mm -hmm. Out of the system altogether. If they're not performing properly and is well documented and not allowing it to be part of a political discussion but showing where they are not really performed at standard, then they need to be removed, not shifted to another level. And Randy probably will say that there are systems in place and will be systems in place to remove bad teachers, because we don't need to have bad teachers. We were part, when I was on the board and also in District 5, of some teachers who were tenured, but at the same time, just not performing up to standard. Do you think those systems in place actually work? I think that as I read the New York Times article today, if I was a district superintendent, the first person I would hire to be 
Uh, my staff person, if I was a superintendent, would be an HR expert, a human resources expert, who has legal background, so you have documentation. And I think the system is put in place to remove politics from the discussion, so that way you don't remove people based on political beliefs. But at the same time, you need to be an HR expert to make sure you have documentation so you remove people and follow the letter of the law. So I would have an HR person as my first person that I would hire because I don't want teachers on board or principals on board or superintendents uh, who are not performing to the level of satisfaction of me as their ultimate boss. Okay, unfortunately we have to conclude our discussion. Thank you. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thanks Thank a lot, Hermie. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cunytv.cuny.edu, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. We look forward to hearing from you.